Okay, hi everyone. It seems like our numbers are holding steady, so we're gonna go ahead and start the webinar. Um, really happy you could all join us today for this webinar with Earthwatch lead scientist, Annabelle Brooks. So I'm just gonna do a quick bio on Annabelle and then let her have all the time to present. Um, in addition to her role as lead scientist for the Earthwatch expedition, tracking sea turtles in the Bahamas, Annabelle has over 18 years of marine ecology experience conducted in the Bahamas and in the Indian Ocean and has researched sea turtles for the last nine years. Following deployment as a fisheries observer in the North Atlantic, she completed her master's degree in marine and fishery science at the University of Aberdeen, and she's currently completing her PhD through the University of Exeter. We are so lucky to have her with us here today to share her research. Um, so. Uh, thank you for joining us, Annabelle. We're really looking forward to it. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to everyone who's joining in. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to you guys today. So I was asked to speak about just some of the issues that we face here in the Bahamas as far as conserving sea turtles. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and just give a bit of an overview. And then I'll move on to talk a bit more about the education work that we've done over the years. And also at the end, I'm going to give an update just on the state of the uh, things here as far as the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian that came through last year and how it's affected us and some of our partners as well. So I will get started. And I'm not really going to get into any detail about like the biology and ecology of sea turtles. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to bring up first, though, before we go forwards, is just understanding that the turtles that we are studying are endangered species. So there are seven sea turtle species throughout the world. And the three I have listed here are the ones that we might find in the Bahamas um, that spend a, you know, a good portion of their time here. And that's the loggerhead, and that's vulnerable. The green sea turtle, which is pictured here, and they're by far the more abundant of the turtles that we see here and the ones that we study most. Uh, and the green turtle is listed as an endangered species. And the hawk's bill, which is much rarer, is listed as critically endangered. And you can see here on the screen, I've highlighted the IUCN, IUCN red list, which is where you can find this information. Anybody, you can actually log on to this website and you can type in any species of animal or plant and find out just what its listing is and learn more about maybe um, if it is uh, of least concerned to threatened, uh, extinct in the wild, it's highlighted and then extinct. And it tells you a little bit more about the pressures that um, that species might be facing. So yeah, so we are dealing with endangered species here and they're endangered because for a variety of factors. And so I'm just gonna highlight some of the ones that we uh, are more concerned about here in the Bahamas. And speaking of the Bahamas, so hopefully some of you have either traveled here on your own or maybe you've joined us on our expedition out here as well. And I just wanted to show you an image of, of the Bahamas and uh, it's, been in the, it's been in the news a few times uh, mentioned by astronauts, so the Bahamas is the most beautiful place from space, and I would agree. Um, this archipelago is hundreds and hundreds of islands, and you can see just from this image alone just the variety of habitats you get from deep water to shallow bank system. You have all sorts of marine and terrestrial species, some that are endemic just to these islands, and so this big kind of mosaic of habitats makes it a really exceptional place to, to study marine creatures specifically. And I actually, when I was looking for these image, uh, quotes from astronauts, I found this one as well, which is pretty perfect because uh, this astronaut here, Chris Hadfield, he actually took a photo of Eleuthero. So it's kind of upside down here, but you can see where Cape Eleuthero is. So this is the home of, well, my home for the last 15 years and of the Island School and the Institute where our project started. And you can even see some of our study sites. So again, those of you who are volunteers here in the past will maybe recognize some of these sites that uh, you would come and help us out in. So the Bahamas is a really beautiful place and it's also very important for sea turtles as has been found in previous studies. So this was a pretty important study that used genetics to better understand populations of sea turtles in the southern Bahamas. So they went into this one uh, mangrove Tidal Creek area, and through genetic samples, they were able to better understand where those turtles had originally come from. So to just go back into a little bit about turtle biology, the sea turtles that we see here, for instance, were not born here. So they will have been born on a nesting beach 
potentially in any one of these countries. So where you see those dark shadows of sea turtles, those are the nesting beaches where the hatchlings would have emerged and they headed out to the ocean. And in the first few developmental years of their life, they actually spend out at sea. They eventually got brought by currents and settled in the Bahamas. So the star on the map there is, this, is the island in the southern Bahamas where they were studied. And the size of the shadow turtles is representative of the proportion of turtles that came from that area, uh, that ended up there. So you can see Central America, so places like Costa Rica, Nicaragua, are really important for juvenile turtles that then end up here. And some coming from further down the Caribbean or Florida, um, South America, and even as far as the West Coast of Africa. So any time when we are seeing turtles here and we uh, are studying them, we might be dealing with an individual that traveled from uh, pretty far away. And then once they arrive from the Bahamas, at least like three, four, five years of age, they will spend a really long period of time here, just in these beautiful and getting big until they move on to their next life stage where they themselves become sub adults and eventually will move on to nesting, oh sorry, to mating and then on to nesting areas as well. So this is another reason why we work with sea turtles here is because the, the air itself is very important for a regional population of sea turtles. And just to emphasize this, we had a really incredible discovery just a few months ago. So we just recently have partnered up with a group called the Haiti Ocean Project. And they're working with environmental monitoring and education down in Haiti. And because we've been working with them and talking more about sea turtles, which is a species that uh, caught a lot by artisanal fishermen, volunteers from the Haiti Ocean Project have been helping rescue these turtles and release them and just educating more about the value of these sea turtles and so on. And so they were aware of these metal flipper tags that we use in our research and it just so happened, one of the volunteers just so happened to go past this market and you can see the picture there on the left of the turtle that was um, waiting to be sold for food and he noticed these metal tags on the turtle and he was able to actually um, get the turtle from them. Uh, I'm not sure if he bought it or not. They got in touch with me and, they, and told me about their discovery and I said, oh, that's amazing. You know, give me the tag numbers. I'll be able to find out where it came from. And they were reading out the tag number and I was like, that sounds very familiar. And that's because it was actually a turtle that our partner, uh, Stevie Kinnett, who runs Family Island Research and Education, tagged in June 2018 in the Abaco. So just a few summers ago, we were working together up there and he had tagged that turtle and it showed up over 500 miles away in Haiti and just by chance was seen that's working with this environmental group. So again, just to talk about just connectivity and how important these animals are on a regional scale, not just country by country. And what was really impressive was this turtle wasn't even at sub-adult size when you would expect them to migrate. So this was a really amazing finding. As far as you know, why are they important? When we look at this seagrass pasture here, so this, the green sea turtle, want their primary food source is seagrass. And here pictured you've got specifically turtle grass and on the left where you see it's been cropped that's through the activity of sea, uh, green sea turtles who are literally like little lawnmowers just go in and clip away and what they're after really is the new shoot the really juicy nutrient rich shoot that comes out and on the right you can see uh, if ungrazed that's what the seagrass looks like and eventually actually gets very long and it kind of collapses and shades itself and so on so the nicely cropped side of it is actually and also is really important for other organisms as well. So you get fish, invertebrates, economically important ones like the conch, for instance, are found in these seagrass beds. And just through the presence of turtles being there and feeding in these areas makes them uh, better habitats for all these other species. So they have a real important role in that ecosystem. And in terms of where we find them, when we're doing our work here in the Bahamas, Predominantly the green turtle, again, which is pictured here, we go for them in tidal mangrove creeks. So there's no fresh water coming out of these creeks. They're relying solely on tidal influx and outflow of salt water that enters these creek systems. And these small turtles that might arrive around kind of 20 centimeters in size will spend, like I said, a significant amount of time, I mean, 10, 15 years or so, just living in these kind of environments where it's nice and shallow. There's plenty of food. They're going to avoid being eaten until they can get big enough um, to the point where it's a lot harder for a shark to 
essentially get its mouth, its jaws around it. Um, so this is mainly the sites that we uh, go looking for them. And we've been working primarily in these creeks now, like I just, we just talked about for over uh, nine years here on Eleuthera, but there's a lot of other research groups that have been studying it for much longer, and I'll talk about them later. So as far as some of the threats these turtles are facing, so what are our concerns? I'm going to just list a few here. So one of the ones that most probably everybody is of marine debris, specifically plastic uh, pollution in our oceans. And these are photos, again, just here from Eleuthera. Um, actually, we took these last year with a volunteer, Earthwatch volunteer group who we were out just on a reef snorkel. And we all came back, about eight of us all came back with our pockets full of plastics that we found on the reef. And these are just, you can see things like plastic bags that maybe get brought in on currents and end up getting caught up on the reef on soft corals and so on here. Um, when you look at the, the very, unfortunately, especially on the, on the windward, more exposed beaches, you're unfortunately gonna see a lot of um, debris washing up on the beaches. This photo here is specifically of a, beach cleanup that we assisted with last year on, I think it was World Oceans Day, and we supported the Bahamas Plastic Movement and just wanted to name them because they're a really incredible group who are really talking about the plastics issue, particularly in a nation like the Bahamas where much of everything that we have to import is going to be either wrapped in plastic or comes in a plastic container. Uh, but also it's not just about our waste here, it's about what is out in the oceans and washing up. So a lot of this debris can come from anywhere in the Atlantic Ocean from a variety of sources, whether it's marine or land-based sources, and it's washing up on our beaches. Now, we don't necessarily have a huge amount of nesting, for instance, where these, this would be a huge concern as far as entanglement, but we end up with microplastics, and also recent research has shown that marine plastic ingestion is being found in every species of sea turtle, pretty much in every, uh, ocean basin. So it is something that no doubt the turtles here in the Bahamas are also going to be encountering. And here's another image taken from here. So turtles might, this, this highlights fisheries, but it's also this is going back to the marine debris issue. This is just some fishing line that was discarded in the ocean and a green sea turtle ended up getting caught up in it and no doubt drowned. And this is something that we see, we see these images online. Um, but I was pretty shocked when I realized that actually this was taken by Shane Gross and he's a resident in North Eleuthera. And this pho photograph uh, just recently won a, a prize in a photography competition, but it's an Eleuthera and sea turtle. This could easily be one of the turtles that we study here. And it was entangled in fishing gear, even though we don't necessarily have any large commercial fisheries like long line fishery, for instance, which is banned in the Bahamas, uh, which we're very lucky, uh, lucky to be. Debris or just pollution, you know, just discarding of waste that ends up in the ocean is affecting these species as well. And in fact, last summer, this actually just this past summer, just gone when we were in Abaco, um, Dr. Beth Whitman, who I collaborate with on this program as well, this, the volunteers actually caught this stuff. Luckily, it was still alive. Um, but this fishing line that you can see there in the little ziplock that was really uh, caught up all around the front flipper of this turtle and made a pretty nasty. Um, kind of cut into the joint, when, but luckily they were able to pull it all off and then they gave it some iodine and they you know, sent it on its way. Um, and if we hadn't found it, I don't know, you know, what, at some point that would have caused a lot more damage to that turtle. So marine debris, whether it's in the ocean or on the beaches here, is definitely an, uh, uh, a threat to these species. Moving on to something else that we are encountering is the fibropapillomatosis uh, disease or FP disease. And this is something that can affect any species of turtle, but by far um, the most aggravated are the green sea turtles. It's actually known as a green turtle fibropapilloma disease. And it actually stems from a herpes virus, a marine herpes virus that um, has been found pretty much all over the world and a sea turtle might have this virus and what can happen is that something triggers the formation of these tumors and you can see they look uh, pretty terrible. This guy was fairly severely affected. There's some that we find that maybe only have one or two and some that have a lot worse but they can get very big and as you can see they might end up on the, on the joints around the flippers and so what's going to happen eventually as these tumors grow 
their vision is going to be affected. So they might not be able to find food or they might not be able to avoid predators in a system. Um, their swimming capabilities are affected, so they're going to be much slower in responding to things like predators or boats and so on. But eventually it can get to the point where their body condition, they're so weak and their immune system is really heavily depressed that they will die because they just cannot um, withstand other factors that would normally not affect them. So we have seen this here um, very recently. It's shown up in Eleuthera, um, but there are other islands where you don't see it. The tail's extremely healthy, and in some areas where we do see it. So for instance, Abacos um, in Andros Island in Bimini, for instance. And one of the things that we're trying to do really is understand more about this disease. Why would you see it in some places and not others? And what are the triggers so that we can really do more hopefully to prevent this in the future. The next thing I want to talk about is habitat destruction. So the Bahamas is this incredibly beautiful place with this myriad of, of habitats, um, but there is, like anywhere else, unfortunately, a lot of habitat that easily either changed or actually physically removed. And so that is gonna affect the marine species that are living in those, in those areas. Um, in numerous ways, and we still don't really understand how that might affect, for instance, a turtle if its habitat is uh, being removed or being just degraded in some way. So we're kind of chasing a little bit this threat as far as just trying to better understand what are the repercussions. And I'm just going to highlight um, for a few minutes this case study here. So again, some of you, any of you that have been fortunate to come and travel to Eleuthera, this is going to be one of the items on your list, place that you really want to go and see. It's on the southeast tip of the island. And as you can see, it's, it's stunning. The bank water close by, you can see a reef there. The fully clean the Alcorn coral reef, um, you'll find that here. And offshore, you see the deeper water, which eventually it drops off into the Atlantic Ocean and into the Exuma Sound. And so you get a mixture of deep and shallow water here. Those keys that you can see just offshore, they are habitat for important bird species, for instance, like nesting terns that come in the summer to use this area. Really stunning place. The sand is actually as even pinker than it looks in this picture. And if you look at it from another perspective, you can see there's these salt ponds, which we still don't even really truly understand. Uh, there are various geologists that have come and worked in these habitats in, inland as well to really understand more about the unique habitats and uh, in there. We know that certain species of ducks and other birds as well use these areas for feeding and, and for nesting. Um, so really stunning place, one more photo here. Uh, most of the time when you go here, you're not gonna see anybody else. Um, it's definitely becoming more popular. And so you kind of groan a little bit when you show up and there's another car, but otherwise it's really a truly remote, just, just stunning part of not just Eleuthera, but the Bahamas. Now, sadly, in a year or so, this is actually what it's going to look like. So this um, is unfortunately private property, bulk of this area, and the government of the Bahamas gave approval to Disney Line cruise ships to purchase and um, eventually build what you see here. So there's gonna be a lot of structures, there's gonna be access for cruise ships to come in to use the area, umbrellas and you know all the rest of it, beach bars and so on are gonna be on the beach. Um, if you, this is the image on the left there, you can see their proposed plans. Um, everything from huge dock systems that are gonna have to go in between the land and the deeper water, you know, customer kind of beach areas, back, front of house, back of house kind of areas, walkways, all those kind of things are gonna happen in that area. And um, sadly, those remote beaches are eventually gonna look like that. Uh, the ridiculous, well, I, in my opinion, the ridiculous thing is that there is another cruise ship port just down the road, literally a few miles away, there's an area called Princess Keys. And the point I'm getting at here is if you look at this picture, um, it's not hard to see that this probably isn't the natural shape of that area. You can see that there's been a lot of dredging, um, sand has been around, uh, an engineered area. And behind the main beachfront there, you can see those are actually mangroves. So mangroves were no doubt having to be cleared to make space. And also you can even see a road was put right through the middle of the mangrove as well. So there's lots of other examples of this in the Bahama. If anybody's traveled to Bimini or knows of Bimini, you can again see, and Bimini is, is a very, very small island and you can see they've literally constructed 
uh, and created new land there on the North Island of Bimini. Um, the bottom picture shows what everyone knew was going to happen, even though we were told it wasn't going to happen. And you can see that uh, with all the dredging, you get a lot of overflow and siltation and so on in the area. But anyway, my point is that these are not, this is not good news. Um, just recently, Carnival Cruise Lines has been on the news a lot as well. And we are aware that there's been a lot of dumping, illegal dumping of um, various waste products in the Bahamian, in Bahamian waters. And unfortunately, all that can really, all that happens is that they get fined. And the fine that they receive is a fraction of their income or the profit that they make. So there isn't necessarily always incentive to follow the rules. Um, and the point I'm just getting at here is that this kind of unsustainable development, unsustainable tourism is unfortunately something that is happening and fresh plans are being approved. Um, and it may seem a wonderful way to see the Bahamas, but even if just a few people have learned that it's a very destructive uh, form of tourism, then I'll be happy. Um, so at this point in the coming years as this happens, on a smaller scale, though, habitat destruction can happen. It take a variety of forms. It might be as simple as putting up seawalls or fences in marine habitats. So animals that use those, for instance, like sea turtles that will be coming up to nest, in the time that has uh, pass between them may potentially being a hatchling and then returning to these nests, they're finding obstructions and so it might actually prevent nest, uh, nesting activity from happening. And the top picture there you can see there's a lot of remote areas in the Bahamas and you have to get through a lot of these flats or mangrove systems to get to the coastal zone and so roads are put through them without much thought into what's going to happen to the ecology and so if you're preventing water flow or movement of animals in and out of an area you know, what's going to be the impact of that ecologically. And these are mainly just human, um, directly related to human activity. And some that are a little bit more indirect are things like coastal erosion. And so, for example, um, with the increase in much more dramatic uh, weather, so bigger storms, more frequent hurricanes, for instance, we're going to see a lot more erosion on the coastline. And so, for instance, if this is a nesting beach, if a turtles, turtles have already nested, their nest mate wash out, um, or it might just be impossible for a turtle to reach the area they want to just because the, the land has been washed away due to that. And this is gonna be related again back to climate change and how that is changing our weather patterns here. Um, so that's just to sum up there on coastal uh, habitat destruction. One of the other threats that we have seen firsthand here in the Bahamas, sorry, I should have mentioned there are going to be some more graphic pictures here. Uh, again, these are two photos taken here on Eleuthera. So the, we might sometimes, when we've gone to our fields, sea turtles. Um, the one on the right was in North Eleuthera, uh, again, in a habitat where quite clearly the turtles have been taken for their meat. And it is traditionally a food, um, it's a, it's a part of Bahamian culture in the past to eat turtle. And since turtles were protected in 2009, that is now illegal. There is no allowed harvest or take of, or sale of sea turtles, but we do see evidence of people still um, harvesting turtles. And um, this again is a problem as far as trying to better understand you know, the fact that these turtles have come from other countries, they would then go back to those countries and that they are of course an endangered species. And one of the troubles is that when we look, see these turtles, we might go into one of their habitats for in, in, a, in one particular tidal creek, and we might see 20, 30 of these turtles. And so there's this illusion of abundance. But the problem is that they're all aggregating in these small habitats because it has, you know, it has what they need. It might be some great food. Um, there's lots of shelter in there from predators. And so you end up seeing them in these little aggregations. And it gives us an illusion that there's plenty of them or that there's more than before, for instance. But from what we know about the fact these turtles have very long life cycles, um, they take a long time to develop and to mature. But increase that, that we see here is going to fluctuate. Some years we see more, some years we see less. And so we need to continue to protect them because of these other issues we've just talked about from disease and And so um, depending on, on the island, you might see more or less of this illegal harvest. The next threat I'm going to talk about is that it's 
it's not so much to be stated as a threat, but really actually ties into what we're looking at here as far as this poaching. So poaching is illegal. What we are starting to see more of now though, however, is actual turtle tourism. And so the flip side of, you know, harvesting turtles to eat them for meal to sell for their meat is actually, there's economic value in them alive. So plenty of people right, would love to be able to go out, you want to see the marine life, cute things like sea turtles. And so there are actually, there's been a big increase in turtle tours or adventure tours. And so you can pay to go out with a local tour operator and go out into certain areas in the Bahamas and see turtles very up close. And so they, to do that, they're feeding the turtle what they wouldn't normally be eating. So you can see here, this picture is um, squid. And that's normal part, not a normal part of the diet. In fact, the turtles here are very chubby and uh, doing really well. They're obviously very happy about all this extra protein that they're getting. Um, but then you don't see normal behavior. It's not normal for a turtle to come right up to you. And again, people have been out and volunteered with us to do turtle research. You know just how hard it is to catch a turtle. You know, they um, are very skittish typically. If you see one, it sees you, it's gone. Um, so this is really incredible to be able to see them up close. It unfortunately means that you get a lot more boat traffic in these areas. You're also gonna get a lot more um, people in the water, potentially people touching them as well. So the reason I put this in there here is that we just still don't know enough about the impact this kind of activity is gonna have on the turtles and how it might change their behaviors and movements and their feeding. Uh, to really understand it but it's a very fine line because we also want people to value these animals alive um so i'm going to move on in a second but before i do that i wanted to show you this just for a little bit of a break <laughs> the volume um this is a video i took at that turtle feeding site and as you can see this is not very normal like skittish behavior of these turtles um but it was amazing. It was very incredible. And it was, for me, it was amazing to see these turtles up close. So I can only imagine for someone who's never seen a sea turtle or never really spent time in warm water, warm, clear waters, uh, to be able to see this is really important. And the reason I, I wanted to show this video and talk about this is also as we transition on now to talking more about the role of education and conserving sea turtles specifically, but really just the environment in general is we need to be able to experience the environment to really appreciate it, to feel the benefit of it, and then also therefore to have a desire to protect it and for it to, to continue. So I'm gonna talk a bit now about the various education initiatives we've been involved over the years. Um, I'm gonna start off with a photo of my children. I hope nobody minds. Uh, on the left there uh, is my son, Nicky. So he was an, even two years old, he was maybe two, and he actually came out in the field with my Earth Watch volunteers. And this was the first time he ever saw a sea turtle and he was a little bit nervous. He didn't really ever want to get too close for it, but I could see the, the intrigue in his eyes and just the way he behaved. He was really pretty amazed by it. Uh, the photo on the next side is them a little bit older, so now nearly seven. And then my other son who's uh, just turned four and without even prompting, uh, was out in the field, saw this amazing little juvenile turtle uh, and he immediately said, I'm going to call it Cherry. And he just, he fell in love in that instant with this turtle. And yeah, these are really just, a, at any age you can have that kind of experience where you see something and you're immediately just raptured by it. But I think starting from a very young age is very important. And my, my husband and I as biologists have always encouraged for our children to be involved um, with, uh, in, in nature and understanding nature more. And that might be time to time. So, Nobody was hurt in this, but you can see when your child starts doing using his, using his tools to fix the, his teddies, that he's obviously, something has happened, there's been a connection there, and he's doing what he sees. Now, I don't use hammers on turtles, of course, but he sees us, you know, working with these animals, maybe putting tags on them and studying them. And that is something that has captured his imagination now and is part of him and is going to stay with him. I'm very lucky, like, all kind of just joking aside, the organization that I... Um, starting the sea turtle program, which I'm going to talk about now, the Island School starts education with these youngest crew. So the youngest students that get to come here are two and a half years old, and their teachers are pretty incredible teaching them about the local environment. You can see here they actually did a whole project on sea turtles, and my son came home with a whole manual guide to sea turtles, which I still reference. So 
moving on though to talk more about the Iron School and the Cape Luther Institute. So when we established the Sea Turtle Program um, back in 2010, um, the real the work that we were able to do was really all down to having these students on board with us. And so if you don't know about the Iron School, these um, it's a semester abroad program for high school age students and they will spend three months down here and part of the organization is the Cape Luther Institute and the idea is that the goal and what does happen here is that students have become very connected to a place and they learn experientially and by doing and one of the classes they get to take is applied scientific research so my team and I would always have a group of about six students that were spending three months learning about these issues that we were dealing with learning field techniques and how to conduct the research and then they'd go on eventually to also communicate their findings but the 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 students that get to come out with us are 15 16 years old and actually if we look at this picture um there's also other things going on here we've got interns that are coming out with us we've got graduate students um volunteers everybody gets involved at some level in these different research projects uh some for much longer than others and in that top picture, actually, the lady in the middle there in the red rash guard, Megan, she was actually a student of the Island School. So I taught her when she was like 15, 16. She'd come back as a born, uh, sorry, as intern. She came back as a research assistant. She came back as a master's student to do her work. So there's lots of different ages and levels of education that happens here. And it's a really amazing opportunity. And we get to do research, but also really talk about the issues that are facing the natural world with these students. Um, and it has a real big impact on them from what we see. This is an example of at the end of the semester, the students will actually have done the statistical analysis, they'll report on their findings, uh, they produce these scientific posters, and we all organize a research symposium. And this lady here in this picture, at that time, she was actually the director of global shark conservation for the Pew um, Trust. So important lady, and there are some students that have been studying sharks for the last few months talking about their findings to her. So it's an amazing opportunity these students have. And they'll also give PowerPoint presentations. So here's a 10 minute PowerPoint in terms of just what they achieve, but also they're getting involved in real hands on it, um, real scientific research. Uh, they're also working with the community. So through them, we're able to reach other people that wouldn't normally necessarily learn about our work. You know, they're not necessarily reading scientific publications, but they're really important stakeholders in the conservation of these animals and the students are involved in that. The other arm of our organization uh, of the Island School is the Deep Creek Middle School. So again, uh, working with Bahamians and getting them out into these habitats that they might not normally really get to spend much time in and showing them what is there and getting them involved in what we're studying and being a part of it and understanding more about you know why do we care about certain animals like sea turtles you know why are they valuable why are they being protected um, and so on now through doing this work early on we discovered that a lot of people so locals on Eleuthera were actually not even aware that sea turtles were protected so the ban was put in place in 2009 but Few, several years later, even five, six years later, people still didn't know that. And part of the issue there is because the Palm is an island nation, and so there's a lot of fragmentation, and it's very hard for communications from like, the capital to get out to these areas, and there's not a lot of just resources to do that kind of work. So we started a project where we actually went to every school on Eleuthera, so we had uh, our research assistants and interns went to 17 schools on Eleuthera and gave presentations about turtles, talked about why they're important, make sure they understood the ban. And the fabulous thing was that actually sea turtles were a vehicle to talk about other marine species too. We talked about all kinds of marine regulations, um, which so it was really great that there was like a segue uh, to helping learn about really everything that's ecologically and economically important here. Um, the smallest school, this was a five student <laughs> classroom uh, up in North Luther. We even went there as a, on its own tiny little island. Um, and the end of this amazing program about, um, I think it was 17 students from about five different islands in the Bahamas and we were able to fly them over and they spent three days in the field assisting the research team with our work. And again, just learning more about, you know, just the importance of conserving these species. And 
They did beach cleanups as well. So we talked about some of these wider threats. And this is an example. You can't actually see the scale in the next picture, but you can see it. They collected beach debris, and then they actually had this big art project where they, which still exists today, where they created it out of all the beach plastic that they found. Um, and some of these um, more children, that was what they were, they came, have since come back actually as um, Bahamian students at the Iron School as well. So it was a really awesome initiative. Um, some of the other work we do is also just in the community. So in the Bahamas, you have events called homecomings, and that's where um, the community really gets maybe have travel further for work, come back home, and there'll be lots of food and music and so on. And we often will have a booth there and talk more about all the various initiatives that we have, uh, conservation initiatives quite primarily on campus and uh, talk about that. And again, the main goal really was just to let people know these animals are protected and here is why. This isn't really anything new though. We definitely didn't, um, we didn't invent this. So we are really doing, trying to continue the work of others. And um, I wanted to highlight a few people here. So we're very fortunate to conduct our research alongside the Archicar Center for Sea Turtle Research. And that's led there on the left, you can see Dr. Karen Bjorndal and Dr. Alan Bolton who lead that. And on the right, you see Stevie Kinnett and Barbara Crouchley, and they run the Family Island Research and Education. And those two people there on the right on the wetsuits are the people that taught me to catch my first turtle and show me where the turtles were and teach me about them and connect me with the other two people so that we could start our own research program. So really indebted to them. And particularly Stevie and Barbara then, who've been working for decades with the Archie Car Center, they spend all the, pretty much the majority of their year sailing through the islands of the Bahamas and they will go to schools and they will talk about sea turtles and again, why they're important, why they should be conserved, what they can do about it as well and how they can increase um, sorry, how they can help protect their marine environments locally as well. And they'll go into schools, they'll go into local communities, and they just ask people to come out with them and get involved um, and help them. And one of the biggest uh, long uh, impacts uh, initiatives that um, is going here, going on here for Bahamian Scholarship. And this organization known as Brief, they spearhead this and they will send. Um, they have scholarships for Bahamian students who finish high school to spend a semester at that island school, but then also go out in the field and do internships in various environmental groups here in the Bahamas, like the Bahamas National Trust, for instance. And they'll go spend time on Stevie's boat for three or four weeks at a time and, and learn about turtles and help them catch them. And this is to capture them, I mean, as part of a research program. So they have a, one of the longest running tagging programs in all the Bahamas that really has taught us so much about sea turtles here. Uh, if you want to follow them, you can learn more about them here. So they've got a Facebook page, Bahamas Sea Turtle Research. Um, and through this, I just want to mention the Bahamas Sea Turtle Network. And so this work has, this network is from you know, us and the people I just mentioned from Archie Carr and also the Family Island Research Education Group, but then also the other groups. And we wanted to connect everybody that was doing environmental work, but also focusing on sea turtles. So we have a huge network now where we are able to deal with um, reports of illegal activity, um, disease in turtles, any nesting, and we're actually starting to learn a lot just by networking with other groups now. And this is available on the internet, and we have a lot of reports that come through our Facebook page now, and they will let us know if, where they might have seen a nest, or maybe where they'd see a dead turtle and so on, and it's been a really incredible collaboration um, to the point where, for instance, you know, we had a turtle that was really severely injured that some uh, visitors found. And through this network, we were able to connect with the aquarium group and the vet group at Atlantis Resorts. And they actually were able to fly this turtle to get veterinary help. And it was since then released. So really amazing group and privileged to be able to all work together. So I'm going to move on now to talk a little bit more about our volunteers. So primarily the Earthwatch volunteers. Uh, of inform information is increasing in terms of just the benefit of course of us just for ourselves personally selfishly in being in nature um it's undoubtable that we all feel much better when we spend less time indoors and stuck at our computers and more time outdoors and um working with seagulls is just one of the ways that you could do that and i just 
I was going through my photos. I wanted to show um, some images of our volunteers that have come out. Now, this is actually our uh, seventh year of Earthwatch teams uh, working with us. And I was just struck by these spaces. And it's true, it's like, you know, you catch your first turtle and you're very excited. You may be exhausted because you've been swimming maybe a long time, but you're just so, you've been able to witness this animal up close swimming underwater and now you're holding it. Um, it's a really incredible feeling. And I think that experience alone is something that can strike people and it'll take it away with them for a long time. And hopefully, you know, not everyone is necessarily living with sea turtles around them, but it connects you back to nature. And when you go back home, after spending time with us out in the field, you also learn about other issues that are affecting the marine environment and issues that you also have an influence on even when you're back at home. So we make sure to talk about all those things like sustainable fisheries, for instance. Um, some of the groups we work with are team team. So uh, this is actually some photos just from last summer. So we host quite a few school groups as well as team teams in the summertime and we love them. Uh, aside from, you know, put maybe they're like on the swim team at school or on the, on the water polo team. Um, they love catching turtles and it's a huge, huge help. And actually just last summer alone, we actually broke a huge record that with them, three team groups, we actually caught over 200 turtles in the space of three weeks, which was really amazing. And we learned so much about um, the animals up in Abaco. And of course, I mean, aside from the actual catching a turtle, there's something to be said also for being there and actually being first hand. You can see uh, Beth, Dr. Beth Whitman there up in the top, you know, collecting data alongside research and letting you do collect those numbers on your spreadsheet. You know, what do you eventually, what can you do with that information and what does that look like um, in the future? Also, it's really, we're really just honored to be able to, you know, a lot of these. Um, young adults, they are maybe thinking about where they're going to go to college in the future and to be able to give people like an insight and the handles and experience and show, you know, this is what you could be doing um, has been really awesome. And we definitely have a lot of people that are interested in finding out more and asking us questions about just academic careers and so on in science and marine science specifically. So it's really that we get to uh, do that kind of work as well. Um, we also make them do some terrible things. We unfortunately had a turtle to dissect, but they were champs. They all, actually quite a few of them got involved and got their hands dirty and uh, helped us dissect that animal so we could learn more about uh, what was going on inside. Um, but yeah, we love them. We love those groups. And uh, we, I'm for, really sad, unfortunately, this year we're not able to have any of these. We've got a few school groups on our team teams, but we hope to get those started again next year uh, back in Abaco. Um, the last thing I wanted to just show you guys as far as education is this, this amazing collaboration that started back in 2014 with um, Professor Duncan Urshik. He is at UMass Amherst and he started this um, group here called Digital Life. And so what he does, he's really uh, very much interested in morphology and, and animal movement. And he visited us down here at CDI and I took him in the field with me and we were looking at these turtles and he was, you know, just looking at form and function of these animals and started taking photos and I'm not sure if I can, can I do this? Yeah. So he's like created this and he showed me this is what the kind of thing we could do. And so he showed me this video and I was like, oh, this is really, um, and eventually turned into something much bigger. And we ended up, this is not a real turtle here in the middle, it's a plastic turtle. Um, we ended up working through, or well, he did really, we just assisted him. He ended up working through these very sea directions of what he calls the beast cam. And so it's multiple cameras at very different angles, all taking simultaneous photos. And eventually you put a real turtle in there, you take all your photos very quickly. And eventually you're able to create very realistic models, computerized models of these animals that you're working with. And so we were really excited. Of course, these are endangered species. The fact that you could create a real life model that you could share and that anybody could look at uh, was really appealing. And we started a project to document all seven species in way. And we got pretty far. We actually ended up um, going to Costa Rica about a year and a half ago and working with Lee Olive Ridley over there. And again, he had already Kind of um, improved upon his system. This is with Dr. Jeanette Weinerkam there as well. We work together out there. And eventually the next phase of what we're trying to do 
is, uh, you can see Duncan here, we're gonna try and do this on the water and have the turtle swimming so eventually we can actually get full on swimming behavior in these animals as well. Um, but I just want to show you one of the, oh, let's see if I can do this right, I just wanna show you, because this is something that you can actually just go and download right now. So the goal of this is always to create things that are available for education and they're completely free as well. See if this works, yes. So, hopefully you can see all that. So, there's a, um, this website is called Sketchpad. And if you go on there and you look at Digital Life, you can actually download, and it's already been downloaded 1.8 thousand times, and it's been viewed 11.7 thousand times. But these models are now available for anyone, and they're downloaded, you can use them in the classroom, wherever you want. And what's really cool is you can touch them and look at them. You can see this turtle actually had a flipper missing. And you can see the movement. So this is actually computerized kind of um, manipulation of the model to make it look like it's swimming. And so we're really excited for the next phase to be actual swimming turtles. This is an example of work that we can do with them and it could be used anywhere in the world, you know, even if you're in the middle of a country to be able to look at marine creatures. So we're really excited about this. Um, all right, back. The other thing he's been able to do with these models as well is create these 3D printed turtles. So these are actually pretty small, they're only like a few inches in size. Um, and this will be part of like an education packet where, uh, for instance, in a school, you could have these 3D printed turtles, learn about the turtles and also paint your turtle and so on and keep the turtle. So he's really um, excited about thinking about how it can be used to increase education opportunities and also in a lot of places where uh, people do research you, there's no you're not allowed to you know take samples or remove animals for instance um, and so being able to do something where you can just take photos and then recreate a model afterwards is a lot of opportunities um, so yes that's been a really exciting partnership with him um, and I've been talking for a long time I'm at my last section so I wanted to just talk a little bit about Hurricane Dorian, uh, we've had quite a few groups now that have worked with us in the abacus and we unfortunately will not be returning there this year but we are excited to, to try for next year. Um, if you're not aware, Hurricane Dorian uh, is, well it, was, it hit the Northern Bahamas uh, September 1st and 2nd last year and was the biggest hurricane to ever hit the Bahamas and actually one of the largest ever in the Atlantic to make landfall. Um, and so you can see that arrows there. So we've got Marsh Harbor. So that's where we work out of when we're in the Abacos. Uh, you can see where we are down below Cape Eleuthera. Extremely lucky we just had tropical storm weather down here. Um, but Dorian did it made landfall on Elbow Key first where a lot of our uh, partners and uh, friends live and then it went on into Marsh Harbor. I know that you've seen um, plenty of this on the news. Um, I wanna say, I'm gonna just talk for a second about some of the environmental impacts it has, but first and foremost is the loss of life and property and livelihoods that has occurred. So there are still people that are unaccounted for and that are missing. People lost their entire homes and just, I mean, all their belongings. So that is by far the most important thing to be concerned with and that we hope um, people are going to be able to rebuild and so on. But um, after that, I'm just now going to also talk about just the effects that it has had on the marine life. Um, and I was, um, I was there after the storm, so I'm just going to show you some of the photos up hand, uh, uh, first hand of what we were seeing. But then after, I was just talking more about the, from the perspective of the various environmental groups are based and have actually since gone on to do post-storm assessments. Um, I mean, you can see right straight up here, the damage that was, um, well, to property, obviously boats on land, but also you can just see the mangroves straight away. One of the, thing, the most things that was most striking when we first got there was just how brown everything was. So trees both lost, but also foliage, just everything removed, and particularly in the mangroves closest to where the storm and the eye went through. And now a lot of debris as well. And so a lot of this debris ended up, which is now underwater or stuck in the trees. And so there's going to be take a long time to recover from that kind of physical damage and obstruction that that's causing. Um, same thing happened right on land. Um, 
just debris, um, huge amounts of debris, uh, and loss of structure and homes and so on. So this is really shocking. I'm going to go straight to here. So some of you maybe recognize this have been with us So the building at the very back there is the dorms that we would stay in at the Friends of the Environment, the uh, Kenyan Center. And extremely luckily, uh, pretty unscathed and actually relief groups are staying in there right now. They lost a few solar panels and that was it. Unfortunately, the building in the front, as you can see, which was the offices of the Friends of the Environment and the um, very new Bahamas Natural History Museum um, completely destroyed. And there you can see that was actually our team team just uh, past summer, just gone. Uh, we're very fortunate. Dr. Nancy Albury, though, who's one of the foremost cave biologists here in the Bahamas. Um, she was giving a tour to them and talking more about the geology of Bahamas. And that museum in itself was the first of its kind and very new just a few years ago. And that's all, unfortunately, was destroyed. Um, so, like I just mentioned, though, however, this dorm was pretty well unscathed. Um, we were not going to return this ship just because it was too difficult logistically. Um, but by 2021, um, they're very excited for us to return. And we're sure that we'll get to about where we're going to be in both years and things like that, so that hopefully we can continue to do our work over there. Um, the other groups, so I got in touch with some of the other groups just to find out what they, you know, what they've been finding. So they're based right there. So this is Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization. And during the storm, there were um, a few strandings of marine mammals. So you can see one that was here actually right in Elbow Key. And was probably was being, you know, those animals got disoriented during um, the extreme weather. Right afterwards, though, they were able to go out and do aerial surveys. And they were really just looking for sightings of various marine mammals, including dolphins. And, um, they found most of what uh, they needed to account for, like various calves uh, and mother pairs. Um, but what it is now, what this situation is providing is over the years, they'd seen a loss of the, their dolphin population. And they believe it's because of the high amount of traffic that was in there, boat traffic. So you get a lot of cruisers, lots of ferry boats, and just general water sports and just watercraft in the area all the time. And they thought that that noise was pushing out the dolphin community now that's pretty much zero. So they're interesting to look at, you know, comparing before and after with that respect. Um, Brian Kaycook, who um, is another incredible cave diver and works with the Bahamas Cave Research Foundation. He was there through the storm and he primarily works with these inland blue holes, which are freshwater systems on the kind of like a top layer. And then underneath they become salt water where eventually underground through various tunnels and so on, they're actually connected to to the sea. And um, one thing that was really incredible that he mentioned was that the halo climb, so where the fresh water becomes salt, increased, the depth of it increased by five meters after the storm, which has never been seen. So that's the volume of rain and fresh water that was hitting uh, the mainland there in the Abaco that it actually pushed the salt layer out of the way. And so they're gonna continue monitoring that to see um, how long that's gonna take to recover. Um, by far one of the biggest uh, impacts with all this debris was um, on the reefs and so the Perry Institute for Marine Science, they are the main group that have done a lot of marine surveys throughout the islands, really learning more about reef health. Um, they were able to get back out there in October time and you can see from these pictures there's a huge amount of debris that was getting blown off from the land that ended up in the sea and there's various groups that are actually physically removing all of this but that caused a lot of damage to the reef but also equally um, Dr. Dolgren, who I said, he said that in some areas you could see this huge damage, but in other areas it was no different. So very luckily, areas like this, this is a critically endangered Elkhorn coral, um, looking just as it did before the storm. And then just moving back to turtles, so this is just my last few slides. Um, because the hurricane came in September, the previous few months there was actually quite a lot of nesting, and Elbow Key actually has a, quite a lot of nesting. Uh, with, in comparison to the rest of the Bahamas. We have a lot of turtle nests reported there. So unfortunately, some of them will have gotten washed out due to the storm for you know, to hatchings that hadn't emerged yet. Um, some did survive after the storm. Some beaches got washed out. Some very lucky turtles actually were rescued. So this was actually somebody who lives on the island. She went and dug up where she knew there was a nest. And this is something that she did upon advice, not something that anybody should just go ahead and do. But based on the time that was left for these 
turtles in their incubation and they were very close to emerging, but it would have happened right during the storm. She was able to remove the eggs and she put them in a huge bucket in her garage and luckily her house withstood the storm and they emerged, um, they hatched from their eggs in that week afterwards and it just so happened I was there and I actually got to see my first little hatching I've never seen uh, on the beach. So that was a happy moment in the middle of the of all of that. Um, one other thing that um, we heard about during the storm and we weren't able to get very close to our study sites unfortunately because the weather after the storm was it was also very bad it made it very hard for anybody to get out on the water so we weren't able to get in there and check on the turtles that we tagged the previous summer but we got this notification and so you can see one of the resorts there people that had you know been there through the storm soon afterwards they actually found this turtle on the road and it happened to have tags and so they reported it and through the wonders of Facebook, we were able to trace it to us as well. Volunteers just last July. But the good news was, even though he was on the land, he was very close to where we tagged it originally, and um, he got put back in the same area. And really, this, this is mainly most likely because of the storm surge was so huge that um, um, it must have got washed in shore. So that's really the main things that we know. Like I said, we will be returning next year and we are in contact with our partners and just supporting them any way we can while they are rebuilding as well. And so that's the end of my presentation. I just wanted to thank all of our various partners and there's many more. Um, there's just so many interns, students, volunteers, graduate students, just collaborators that have involved in various projects over the years and making it possible to do what we do. Um, so I just wanted to thank really everybody and um, thank you all for listening as well and the last thing is just there's our facebook page so if anybody wants to follow us you can follow what we're up to on there thank you awesome thank you so much annabelle um we have time for just a few questions if that works for Sorry. you <laughs> oh that's fine i i mean this is so enjoyable all the hour flew by um so the first question was related a bit to what you were mentioning with hurricane dorian um, this is from Mike. He asks, as you said, increased strength and frequency of weather events can affect turtle nesting through increased erosion to beaches. How does peak hurricane season relate to peak nesting season? How long would it take for a natural beach to recover after a severe storm? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, technically hurricane season starts in June, but the worst the most activity, I guess you could say, with bad weather typically is kind of end of August through October. Um, the nesting season can start anywhere from around late April, early May through to August. So once the female turtle nests, uh, sorry, in the nest, those hatchlings will take around close to about two months to incubate. So if you figure, you know, if a turtle is nesting in July, her hatchlings wouldn't really be emerging until the end of September. And so they're right in the middle of that um, kind of peak activity, I guess you can say. And so I wasn't able to include it, but the Friends of the Environment who support us and um, supply a lot of the nesting activity information in the Abacos, they have seen in previous years when we've gotten big storms and not because of hurricane, really just, just big, big storms that are just more and more frequent now. They will see a whole June phase be eroded away and see the eggs kind of sticking out of the middle of that June ridge. And unfortunately, those turtles are not going to survive that because they can't be submerged. Um, so with respect to the hurricane, they did say also there has been quite a lot of sand shifting. Um, it can also take place seasonally. Generally, depending on the prevailing wind direction, you're going to get movement of sand from some areas to others. And so that can be a natural system or, or cycle, rather. The problem is, this abnormal and increased frequency of really strong energy, whether it's, you know, just storm waves or bigger, you know, tropical storms, or just tropical depressions, which we've seen more of. And that's the problem there is that that's increasing and therefore more likely for these nests to not survive. Have they got answer everything? Yeah, you got it. Um, this next question um, is kind of a two part question. Um, in regards to your community engagement slash and collaboration activities, how are 
or are Earthwatch volunteers involved? And then after that one, it's a little bit broader. Um, how important is are the Earthwatch volunteers to your research? Yeah. So with respect to the first part of the question with the outreach, um, volunteers have actually been part of these interactive, um, well, basically the interviews. So we actually will train volunteers up to give these interviews. We did quite a lot of them last summer in Abaco where we really are just wanting to find out what do people already know about sea turtles? Are they aware of the ban? What are their perspectives on conservation of turtles? And really just trying to learn more about what the public uh, want um, or no, sorry. And also that's an opportunity to then provide information as well. So we have produced by the Archie Car Center and so on stickers. And it was a vehicle just to provide, you know, just start a conversation and then we were able to also provide information. And it's been really successful. People to want to talk uh, and they're very excited to receive something and get information from people as well. So that has worked really well. Um, we have also then, the, so the second question was just asking the volunteers and how important they are to the research. So we very rarely will go in the field unless we have volunteers with us. Um, when I was running the turtle research program at the Island School, the Institute, we had other groups that we would also take out. But in the last few years, the direction, because I don't, I no longer run that, the bulk of our field work is all undertaken with volunteers with us. So it's, it's hugely important. And, you know, you can't catch a turtle and run a boat to help us out there to, to capture them. Um, so yeah, very important. And then this will be our last question of the webinar. Um, this is from Miranda and kind of going off of your last question, what happens to the data that is collected from the turtles and how does this, all the data you collect benefit the turtles? Yeah. So we normally, when we catch a turtle, we want to collect as much data as possible from it. So often, well, even though it all ends up on one like data sheet out there, it's very feeding into multiple research projects and useful for multiple questions as well. So it really depends on who's leading that study you know, there's times when maybe it'll be a master's or PhD thesis project um, and it'll tie into their larger work as well. Uh, also, a lot of the work we've done, the, the monitoring we do is really important for long-term um, trends as far as even, you know, a better understanding status of CETA also in the Bahamas are trends looking like numbers are increasing or decreasing. So that kind of work can take a bit longer to do, but the shorter term projects are being they eventually will be being written up and then they will get published. We also provide a lot of information in country as well. So, you know, trying to offer that up to within the CTEL network and also to like, for instance, the Department of Marine Resources to the Bahamas, for instance. Um, and also like that's really a lot of the work that I'm writing up now, which is part of my PhD, is possible because of all the field work that we've done over the years with the Earthwatch volunteers specifically as well. Um, and in terms of how it's going to benefit the turtles, I mean, just trying to better understand, you know, the Bahamas, if you look, remember that, you know, that image at the beginning is, is a huge nation. We're not going to turn it all into a marine protected area. And so what's really important is that we learn more about the real critical areas and the critical factors of how sea turtles can be healthy and make sure they have all the resources they need. And so some of the research we've done is directed at that in terms of trying to show the importance of certain habitats over others and how we can help policymakers decide where they should put protected measures in, for instance, like protected area and so on. Um, and we've looked at rehoming, for instance, the disease, I would say, is one of the more critical things right now. We're right on the edge of just trying to understand more of the spread of this disease and how, based on what we're seeing, it could potentially be a lot worse in the future. And so how are we going to mitigate that as well? Um, so I think the studies and the science, everything that comes out is really important, but if not equal, but ex just extremely important is just the, uh, the contact and getting people out there because we don't just talk about turtles for a whole week. We're also talking about some of the other factors that I've mentioned before, whether it's you know sustainability in terms of how we live our, live our lives, uh, habitat development, when you go to the restaurant and just how we can become just better 
environmentally conscious citizens as well. So that's really important to me personally as well. And a lot of the times, you know, when we're talking about these things, people just what didn't know. And so it's just about the fact that we're there present and having these conversations that all of a sudden it, people have access to information that might actually then go on to change lifestyle changes in the future as well. So I think that's truly important. Great. Um, I just wanted to thank you again, Annabelle, for this amazing presentation and for sharing your time with us today. And okay. thank you everyone for attending. Um, I'm going to be getting the recording of this webinar posted online tomorrow. So keep an eye on that on our social channels, um, on Facebook, that's Earthwatch, as well as Instagram, and on Twitter, that's Earthwatch underscore org. And then um, if you have any questions or comments, feedback you'd like to give, feel free to email us at communications at earthwatch.org. And I'm sure if you had specific questions for Annabelle, her Facebook page is a great tool to use to connect with her. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks again. And yeah, keep an eye out for the link for this. Thank so, you. Thank you, Annabelle.